and welcome to the 49th annual AAKP National Patient Meeting. I hope you've been enjoying the sessions. My name is Diana Kleins and I'm the Executive Director of the AAKP. I am proud to lead an organization that represents those who have chosen to raise their voice in support of greater care choice and innovation in kidney care. And as someone who has a personal connection to kidney disease through a loved one who has since passed, I join in the voices demanding a change in status quo kidney medicine and increased patient care choice without any barriers to accessing all treatments available. With that, I'm honored to lead our session, Patients Empowered, Shared Decision Making, and discuss how AAKP is redefining shared decision making. For the last couple decades, AAKP has defined shared decision making much differently than other medical and kidney stakeholders in America and across the globe, and this slide outlines many of our core principles. We firmly believe that patients are intelligent consumers of healthcare and fully capable of making the most appropriate healthcare decision for their situation when they are fully informed of their choices. We believe that patients have the same aspirations as any other person. And we know patients expect doctors to listen and respect their wishes. That includes the desire to work full-time or part-time at a job of their choice, pursue an education, raise and support a family, own a home, and retire securely. Bottom line, shared decision-making means aligning tr treatments to support patients. So based off these principles, what is true patient-centered shared decision-making and why is it important? It means you care for the whole person, not just the condition. Early screening for identification and accurate diagnosis is paramount. Education on how to slow or prevent disease progression is vital. Educating the patient and any care partner on all available treatment options without any preconceived notion. And avoid making any patient or their family feel that they or their condition is burdensome to the family unit or society or steering them into a particular treatment or no treatment based on their age or, or comorbidities. Bottom line here, doctors and social workers must listen and respect patients. They cannot substitute or impose their personal bias onto patients. Additionally, AAKP believes that patient-centered shared decision-making must include aspects that matter most to patients, their families, when treatments are discussed. And these are the areas that are often left out of existing shared decision-making discussions and tools. And they include cultural and spiritual beliefs in the patient's role within the family unit and or society. So just as importantly as what true patient-centered shared decision-making is, is what it is not. And that is an environment where government-directed mandatory requirements exist to discuss end-of-life care, where third parties like insurers interfere in the doctor-patient relationship, and where coercive efforts exist that make patients feel they need to end life-saving treatments. This is why AAKP set out to develop our own shared decision-making tool that encompasses all of AAKP's principles, takes into consideration all the elements that holistically make a person who they are and influences how and why they make treatment choices, and eliminates the pessimistic national and global narratives away from labeling kidney patients as unwise, burdensome, or too costly. Some highlights of our development process included conducting a landscape assessment with our partners from Engage to Advocate, which found most shared decision-making tools that currently exist are too narrow and focus too heavily on merely the clinical aspect of treatment choice. This is, of course, an important factor, but only one of several patients actually take into consideration when making healthcare decisions. And with that, I should say, AAKP discovered the need for a holistic shared decision-making tool that takes into account more qualitative measures and attributes that are historically more difficult to measure, but lend themselves to supporting an individual's aspirations, responsibilities, and overall quality of life as they define it. And in a future phase of this effort, we are excited about eventually taking the tool global by translating it into other languages and tailoring it for optimal reach. Upon launch, our shared decision-making tool will be available in print and digital formats. 
Now I'd like to move into the next portion of our session where we've invited two individuals to give their perspectives as kidney patients on shared decision making and what is important to them. First, I'd like to introduce Ms. Molly Ball. Molly is a staunch patient advocate and research participant. She has 35 years of business experience and, as, as, and has served as a market marketing manager, a vice president of marketing for a seafood processing firm with revenues of over 75 million. As a person living with diabetic kidney disease, she's dedicated to educating others about diabetes and their right to choice and access to treatment options that support their overall health, well-being, and aspirations. Molly, thank you so much for joining us. Like AEKP, I know this topic is very important to you. Thank you, Diana, for having me today. To begin our Q&A, Molly, AKP believes the medical community, including some researchers, often view kidney patients from the narrow lens of serious illness and the perceived burdens of various treatments. In terms of shared decision making, can you tell us why medical teams must consider all aspects of life that are important to patients, including aspirations like continuing full-time or part-time work and their chosen career path, pursuing an education, working to build a secure retirement, and the value patients place on time with family and interests like travel or hobbies. First of all, I'd like to comment that um, human beings are made up of more than just a body. We are made by our creator or a higher being consisting of a body, a mind, and a spirit. Patients uh, um, have to be treated in re respect to um, their, their lifestyles, and every patient is different. Some patients have come mm -hmm. from different backgrounds, so they uh, have different lifestyles. And uh, it's essential that uh, a patient uh, not be focused just on their disease. They, they have a life to live. Their disease is just... Uh, one aspect of their life. Um, when those people that get diseases center on their disease, they tend not to do so well. Um, when they're focused on looking at uh, how to keep living with, uh, with their diseases uh, and focus on their life, they do tend to do better. They also um, need uh, to uh, work with their doctors um, to have a special relationship building with their doctors. And that requires a lot of communication skills. And every human being is different. It requires a lot of work by the doctors to um, have skills, communi good communication skills and insights to their patients. Uh, some doctors are lacking in this uh, area because the doctors are more scientifically oriented and want to get their protocols forward and used. Uh, but there's no one size fits alls because every human being is so different. It requires uh, um, a lot of work to, to really get a good uh, uh, shared uh, decision-making uh, process going and the problem in today's medical society is that uh, we have uh, constrictions by our insurance companies. I know I only get 10, 15 minute appointments with Medicare, which is very pro pragmatic when I have, uh, I personally have so many comorbidities. My particular doctor says I need more than three appointments to go over everything. So, uh, that's a problem. So um, it's so important to address all the interest of the patients, uh, their lifestyles, their, their hobbies, uh, what they're interested in, to, to match up the treatment so that they can continue doing what makes them happy. Because uh, that's gonna help, help them with their disease in the long run. And Molly, 
AKP also believes that all patients should be treated equally with full respect and the understanding that when fully informed of their care options, patients and doctors they trust can together make wise decisions about treatment plans. Can you tell us why shared decision making should be patient focused and free of any bias among medical professionals toward a patient's perceived socioeconomic status, ethnicity, or other factors, including age? And can you tell us why there should also be full respect extended for a patient's spiritual and cultural beliefs? Patients, uh, when they go to their doctors, at least as far as I'm concerned, most patients pick up right away when a doctor's biased towards them because patients are quite sensitive. First of all, when they have a disease or they're, they come to the appointment, their sensitivity is very uh, pronounced uh, because of just the setting of going to a doctor. So they're about, bound to pick up on that bias uh, quite, a, quite a bit. Um, so the doctors have to be very cautious about that. Um, and uh, it would wreck the relationship building. Um, communication skills are, are, again, they're paramount in doctor-patient relationships. Uh, not only to the outcomes of the healthcare for the patient, but into how the doctor approaches the patient. But, you know, if you get a good doctor, that's half the battle of uh, getting good health care. And, and so many people think it's just, you know, it's a doctor can have the greatest skills in the world, world, but will not be effective if they don't have the trust. That's a key word, the trust and the faith of, of the patient. If the patient can't trust the doctor, it's not going to work out. So uh, that being said, uh, when they pick up on any bias, it, it's a very negativity for the patient. And but going into the idea that uh, the doctor has to respect the the spirituality and the cultural um, aspirations of an idea ideologies of the patient is again paramount. Because I brought up at the beginning how all human beings are made up of body, mind, and spirit. And God does not create junk. God creates beautiful, beautiful human beings. And, and doctors have got to respect uh, their patients as beautiful human beings. And also they've been proven in studies and science that... Uh, that um, the spirit can drive, have a key role in the ability of patients to to uh, achieve uh, cures on diseases. Some patients uh, live longer than others, and why? Wonder why that is. Well, I'll give you an example. You're looking at a lady right now. I have many comorbidities: uh, heart disease, uh, kidney failure type 2 diabetes over 40 years, a type 2 diabetic insulin dependent. And a whole I have a whole bunch of majors and a whole bunch of minors. I can't walk. I'm disabled. No knees, no hips, and no spine left. But guess what? I take all these lemons I got and I make lemonade, lemonade and I got lemonade stands all the way to the mountains from Seattle. It's all a matter of your uh, drive and your spirituality. And so what I do is I have my projects. And when I projects are I go around and help people. And I have major projects now around the entire United States with over 115 Catholic radio stations. They're broadcasting my spots all around 20 states in the nation to get people to pray for our nation, our communities, and our families during these trying times. So I reach out and do, so doing, I forget self. So here's a motto for all kidney patients again. 
look outward not inward when you look outward you forget self when you forget self and you you tend you something inside you your 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 um endorphins forget self and you seem to get better so that's uh, what i do and so that's involved with mind body and spirit so we all all those things work together to help your health go forward to, and it can have a a, a major um, effect on your outcome for your health care. And final question, Molly. You have been an energetic and passionate patient advocate. You have inspired fellow patients to have the confidence and courage to demand the best treatments that align to their needs. What advice do you have for patients that feel their medical professionals do not respect their dreams and aspirations and are not engaged in patient-centered shared decision-making? Should they find another medical team? I don't think right off the bat they should, they should uh, go run out and look for another doctor. I, I say work with your current doctor. A lot of doctors are not even aware of this shared decision-making process. And you see, a lot of doctors, they're not, they're not, they don't have good communication skills. Um, they're, they're boom, 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 because they are, they have relegations of, you know, time limits, as I discussed before, from insurance companies, etc. So um, it might be a good idea for you to collect um, some information about shared decision making find some information run off a couple copies of a couple pages on the subject for your next meeting uh, make an appointment with a doctor and go in there with some educational materials to leave off with the doctor be up front with the doctor tell them you want to discuss shared decision making with them and hand them the the uh, copies of the educational material and ask them to read it and then ask him if you can have a follow-up appointment to discuss it after he's read it. And uh, then you can talk about it and tell him what your ideas are that you'd like to uh, become involved with the shared decision-making um, discussion with him about your future uh, health care program. Uh, if he's uh, willing to, to go forward, you have a beginning basis for discussion. If he's not willing to do that, you've at least been up front with him. And then I think it's time for you to, to think about finding another doctor. But if you, in your research, you should address the questions of your potential new doctor if they're willing to work in that direction with shared decision-making. And if they're not, I wouldn't uh, go forward with a new doctor unless you found one that was willing because more the more a patient studies shared decision making at least from my perspective the more they'll buy into shared decision making because it's a I believe it's a hot topic today and I believe it will do wonders for not only for patient doctor relationships but it will do wonders in the long term for the health care effectiveness for the patient's health and longevity and happiness because in the long run patient-centered decision making will allow patients if when they be, when they live their lives the way they want to, even though they have a disease that they're living with, it doesn't define them as a human being. It's just something they have to they live with. They're able to cope with it. And uh, my philosophy is is that they have the disease, and the idea is, as I told you before, in summary of all this is to continue on living not inwardly but forward thinking keep living your lives to the best of your ability but go forward and um, keep on smiling 
until you get to those pearly gates of heaven. But, you know, live your life with joy. Do what you what makes you happy and, you know, dance with joy. Thank you, Molly. It's always wonderful to have you joining us. Our next patient speaker is Mr. Dean Armendorf, a current dialysis patient and AKP ambassador. Professionally, his career has spanned several decades of service in national public policy and medical affairs, including working for the American Medical Association as a regional political director, where he oversaw their political action committee and engaged with a broad bipartisan coalition of lawmakers with shared concerns for the integrity of the doctor-patient relationship, patient care choice, and policies that support timely access and payment for new medical innovations. Dean, we are so pleased to have you join us to answer a few questions. Diana, thank you. Thank you for having me at this year's Global Summit. It's great to be able to participate. And I really want to thank everyone who's participating because I think this is going to be a great resource for kidney patients around the world. To get started, AKP believes the medical community, including some researchers, often view kidney patients as being all the same. They may view them simply in terms of having a serious illness and not take the time to get to know the person as a whole. Can you tell us how, as a patient, you approached your diagnosis and how you have engaged your medical team to let them know who you are and why your choice of treatment matters to you, your family, and your career? Well, first of all, the most important thing in this whole discussion are, are really two factors. One is every life matters, every patient matters. And secondly, everybody's different. There's not a one size fits all solution. So as that affected me, I just uh, made sure I made it clear where I was coming from. I did as much talking as listening. I told them about my family, told them I have a nine year old son. So being active, having energy, being able to participate in family activities was very important to me. I also have a career and wanted to keep working. I know some folks might choose to work part-time or retire, but I, I really wanted to keep working, felt I still had a lot of uh, a lot to give in that area. And so we tried to work um, the treatment around, around that fact. The one thing that is a problem is of course, there aren't a huge number of options. You have at home dialysis, either PD or chemo or in center. And unfortunately, neither of those options are that great for fully living your life. But I've explained what I wanted. And by pushing, I was able to get more or less what I wanted going, for example, earlier in the morning. So I'd still have most of the day available, both for work and family stuff, only using two weekdays, Tuesday and Thursday, so that I had uh, uh, less time away from work. And so I recommend to all the patients to speak up, to let them know what you're all about, to list out your priorities, and don't just be have the care dictated to you. Be an active participant. And understanding that, AKP also believes that all patients should be treated equally with full respect and when it and with an understanding that when fully informed of their care options, patients and the doctors they trust can together make wise decisions about their treatment. Since you have a long career in medical and policy issues, can you tell us why shared decision-making should be patient-focused and free of any bias among medical professionals toward a patient's perceived socioeconomic status, ethnicity, or other factors, including age? Well, the first part of that is that it should be, as you said, patient centric. This isn't about the insurance companies, it isn't about the providers, it isn't about the money, it's about the patients and what the patients want and what their family and caregivers want. As long as that's kept front and center, things will be okay. Um, there are many instances where people don't have full information. There's a language barrier, a cultural barrier. Um, maybe they're so overwhelmed by the diagnosis and other things they have to do that they can't be a full partner. And then it falls on to the physicians, the social workers, the caregivers to make sure that that voice is being heard. There's no excuse for the patient voice not to be heard and for not to be patient centric. And those excuses are, you know, insurance or lack of insurance, um, ethnicity, race, cultural divisions. None of those things should matter. 
it should matter what the uh, what's important to the patient. When I uh, have done advocacy in the past, I've always tried to tell people stories. I've always tried to put the stories of people in real their real lives first, rather than the numbers or the budget or the policy issue. And as long as you do that when you're making these decisions too, I think things will be good. One of the things I really love about AAKP is that focus on the patient, independent organization, not controlled by providers, not controlled by physicians. And it's also something that is all about the patients and that's what we want. Thank you, Dean. And let's take your response a step further. Can you tell us why there should also be full respect extended for a person's spiritual and cultural beliefs? Well, if we're talking about uh, caring for the whole person, not just looking at them as a disease or as a insurance line item number, then you have to look at the culture, the family, spirituality. These are all part of that whole person that we're talking about. And so, um, uh, for example, I think that uh, the faith of a lot of people really drives their decision making. So if the physician is dismissive of that or doesn't take it into account, then they're not going to be treating that whole person. Uh, I know from my work previously working with the American Medical Association, the cultural uh, distinctions are really important. For example, in the Asian community, someone might defer to the oldest person in the room. Apparently that's part of the culture in some Asian societies. If you're not aware of that as the provider, you might literally be talking to the wrong person in the room. And so these cultural touchstones and faith touchstones are really important and cannot be diminished. And I think in medical education, in the work of the social workers, et cetera, they need to be aware of that importance of that. Just a couple more questions, Dean. We know how you are a longtime advocate for principle-based policies that are people-centered. Based on your experience as a kidney patient on dialysis waiting for a transplant, what advice do you have for fellow patients if they feel their medical team is not listening or respectful of their dreams or aspirations? Should they or their care partners find other medical team? Well, first of all, the short answer is don't give up, keep talking keep expressing what you want, even if you think they're not listening. Always leave the door open to uh, changing providers. Um, I know in the dialysis world, it's difficult because you're tied into a certain center, sometimes tied into a company, but you can change. If you get a different nephrologist, they'll maybe send you to a different center, a different company where there might be more um, uh, responsiveness. The other thing is, you can pick out the techs you want and the nurses you want. So if you've had a bad experience with a certain tech, uh, don't worry about them being offended. Don't worry about uh, rocking the boat. The number one priority has to be your own care and your own satisfaction as a patient. So speak up, take action, and don't let yourself uh, be on the receiving end of, of the care. You need to be driving that care. and. Um, if you don't know what to do, if you're um, feeling overwhelmed by it, get someone to help you. Talk to the social worker in the dialysis center. They generally are very helpful. Or turn to AAKP for resources, because I think there's a lot of uh, resources that we can provide to give you guidance on how to talk, what questions to ask, how to do it. The help is out there. So don't just... Uh, sit back and kind of shrug your shoulders, but take action. And final question, Dean. Based on your kidney journey thus far in your treatment, are there any additional insights you'd like to share with our audience today? Yeah, I think the doctor-patient relationship is really a constant work in progress. You know, in my experience with dialysis, I've been doing it for uh, a few months now, since December of last year, and I'm still trying to get them to tweak things, to get my uh, target weight right, to get the amount they're taking out each time right. And you can't give up. You got to just keep working on that relationship to get it the way you want it. So I know this is a lot. I know that people think, oh my God, there's so much going on. I need to know so many things. Help is out there. There are resources you can use and you can do this because if you will have a much worse outcome if you're not actively involved in your care. 
Thank you, Dean, and thank you, Molly. We appreciate your time and candid responses on this important topic. As we wrap the session, I encourage you to follow AAKP on social media. And if you aren't already a member, please join today at www.aakp.org backslash join. Membership is free for patients, family members, and living donors, and we will keep you up to date on the launch of AKP Shared Decision-Making Tools.